you will find total enlightenment in the garden. William? What? Oh. And we'll help you achieve total enlightenment next on Garden Time. Welcome to Garden Time. We're at Garden Fever today in Northeast Portland, where we'll be talking about the plant pick of the week later in the show. And we also wanted to thank all of you that made it out to Garden Palooza this year and to say that we were sorry, but the, the high wind warnings, we had to close down a little bit early. So if you would still like to find the vendors that were there, you can always go to gardenpalooza.com. And coming up in the show today, we'll show you how to plant and maintain an asparagus bed. We'll also be introducing you to a new book by Timber Press written by local authors. But first, all about mason bees. So I'm standing here with Mitch and we are at Backyard Bird Shop. And normally, Mitch, we talk about birds because that's what you guys do a lot, but you yes. also do other things. So let's jump into mason bees. Um, I was not aware that they're kind of like our native bee. They absolutely are. They're, uh, they're native bees. They're native to the Pacific Northwest in the western part of the United States. That's one variety. There's also an eastern, east of the Rockies, a variety of what's called a solitary orchard mason bee. It is a non-aggressive bee. It doesn't have a stinger. It will not harm you. And they've been here a lot longer than the European honeybees have been, which have been in decline in years, if yeah. you've been reading about that. So we like to encourage mason bees for all the good that they do. And when you say solitary bee, explain that to me. What does that mean, a solitary bee? Right, yeah, that's a great question. William. So they don't go into hives and they, they don't congregate in groups of two and three and four hundred or thousands. They really do their work on their own. They have a lifespan of four to six weeks. Um, they're active um, and around our area from mid-March through um, mid-June. And then, really that and then they are done. Exactly. Okay. I see. I've always thought that they were just a really, really super early spring, but going into June. Going into June, you're exactly right. So early summer, they're considered early spring pollinators uh -huh. and they're super effective pollinators. Some studies show they're more effective than the actual honeybee. Wow. So they can pollinate any number of flowers and early blossoming flowers and fruit trees and bushes, you know, pear trees, cherries, camellias, rhododendrons, those things that are early blooming, um, you will want these kinds of bees around to help in that process. So if, if, if our goal was to get bees, you know, into our areas, our gardens and everything, is there a way to attract these? What is the process of doing that? Yeah, so again, they're a native bee, so they may be in your area, but if you live in, a, in the city or the suburb, you may not have them. And so um, at the Backyard Bird Shop, we offer a lot of mason bee houses. And uh, the mason bees, they really, they... Uh, occupy a small hole in about this size uh -huh. and in nature this would be the hole of an insect of a wood boring beetle or a wood boring insect of some sort or in tree bark or some crevice in a cedar shake and that's and what they would use in nature that's what they would use in nature something like that so we can offer them uh, something similar to that where they can go into a, a tube like this and the female after she's finished mating um, she will go and she will start uh, gathering pollen from various types of plants and bring that back in, and put little clumps of that pollen after 20 20 or 25 trips right in the in the back of this uh, tube then on top of that pollen <clears throat> she will lay a uh, uh, an egg really? and she can interestingly she can determine the sex of the egg when she lays that no which way. is fascinating to me that is yeah so on a, in a tube like this after she does that little process then she will wall that off with a little wall of mud and then she will repeat that process all the way through here so in a tube of this size you could have six or eight viable mason bees the females all laid toward the back and the males towards the front um, because males are considered a little bit uh, dispensable. We, we, we're, we are disposable, aren't we? We're disposable, <laughs> so not fair, but that's the case, is, the case in nature right here. Um, and then at the very end of this uh, tube, however long that is, um, she will put a thicker plug of mud to protect those bees in there from predators, whether it's uh, woodpeckers, different types of birds, or other insects. So that is really great. Okay, so now let's say that I, I, maybe I have a house already that I've had for a long time and see no activity, or I'm just starting and I haven't seen them. What do I do to, to start them in my yard? All right, well, that is a very good question and, and a lot of people ask that. So if you're not sure if you have them, the Backyard Bird Shop at all of our locations offers cocoons in two different forms. So we have them in these tubes right here and uh, there's six to eight bees right in, in and those And I see tubes. the mud at the end. You see the mud. Yeah. There's a rough sort of finish on the end of that that's very, very typical. 
Um, so we have them in that form right here. We also have the cocoons that have actually gone through a whole cleaning process by way of sand or water, and that's taught in our Mason Bee Cocoon Cleaning class, but we offer them as well too. And you can kind of tell the females have bigger cocoons than the males, and, and we can talk about that a little bit, but we offer those at all of our, our shops, and that's one way to know that you're going to have a nice, healthy, um, uh, group of bees in your yard to help with your pollination. Excellent. So these are viable living bees that will emerge as soon as the weather hits about mid 50s for a period of a week or so. Now you said the, there's a lot of different varieties which you mentioned but is there a reason why you would want to use one of the varieties over another? Yep, not necessarily. So this is a, there's a, this is a typical one. If you want more bees you would choose a larger one but this is a typical size right here and this happens to be a, a type of block here that you can actually take apart and clean those cocoons okay. and, and uh, later in the year in November or so. So this is made out of a composite of corn, a corn byproduct and plastic and this is just a great average size bee house right here. This little guard is put on for decorative purposes but also um, it protects from any predators getting in there. So it's really functional and has a little overhang here as well which is important too so those bees don't get pelted by rain. Right. And then where would where, where would we hang them? What is the place that they should Great be? question. So um, they should be hung south facing or southeast or east facing. These bees, in order to become active, their body, body temperature has to reach a certain level. And so if they're facing north or west, they won't get that. But if you put them in the south facing or east facing um, direction at any height, doesn't have to be 10, 15 feet, anything like that. It can be at uh, eye level. Then they will become active sooner during the day, during the course of the day, and they will go do their work. And, and you can actually provide them, uh, since they are mason bees and they take mud to make those little walls in between each cell, you do want to have a, a some place a, where there's mud. Somewhere available. where there's mud. If you don't have mud, then you can dig a little hole and put some moist mud in there and that would be super helpful. Now, you might say to yourself, this is too much. I need, I need more help. You guys also do offer classes on this, right? We do offer classes, yeah. We have two Mason Bee related classes. We have a Mason Bee, what I call 101 class, the basics of Mason Bees that we offer. And in the fall, we have a Mason Bee cocoon cleaning class. Oh. So mm -hmm. some people come in with their houses or they come in with the tubes like this that can be unwound and they want to see how many bees are in there are viable or if there have been uh, parasites or mites that have infested those, some of those uh, cocoons. And if so, they can clean those and get rid of the ones that aren't good and keep the ones like these that we just showed you that are so you can really cultivate a healthy colony of bees in your Perfect. yard and really help with that pollination, which is what you're looking for. Well, there you have it. So for more information, as always, we invite you to go to gardentime.tv. We can click you over their website, you find all the information you need, where their locations are. Come and start a Mason Bee Colony all for yourself at your own garden. Thank you so much. Mason. You're very welcome. Thank you, William. Garden Time is brought to you by Capital Subaru, your way on the parkway. They had to take the car, they had to get it open with the jaws of life, take me out on a backboard, took me to a Trauma One Center. I absolutely feel like the Subaru saved my life. Well, we, we trust Capital. We trust our salesperson here, Jackie. Jackie's great. I believe that she really cares about us. She teaches me about the Subaru. Our, our way, way on the, the parkway. parkway. Since 1926, the Bonite Company has worked with homeowners to make their homes and gardens beautiful. If you have a garden problem, Bonite has the answer. Bonite's patented Slug Magic rainproof formula makes slugs disappear. Safe around pets and wildlife, Slug Magic can be used in fruit and vegetable gardens up to the day of harvest. Visit Bonite.com to find a local retailer and to download your free Bonite Problem Solver app for your iPhone or Droid. Build a beautiful home inside and out at French Prairie Perennials. Inside, we have just the right creative elements to complete your decor. We offer an oasis of unusual, nature-inspired garden and home gifts and accessories. Outside, choose from our wide selection of unique dwarf conifers and sparkling companion plants. French Prairie Perennials, located between Woodburn and Wilsonville. Take exit 278 to Aurora and French Prairie Perennials. For over 100 years, Collier Arborcare and Bartlett Tree Experts have provided tree and shrub care services to the Portland metropolitan area. From large tree and small shrub pruning, tree removal and stump grinding, we can handle all your tree care needs. 
our arborists diagnose and treat your toughest insect and disease problems. We also have organic solutions for growing and maintaining healthy gardens, as well as organic nutrition for your trees and shrubs. Collier and Bartlett, environmentally friendly since 1907. Well, what a delight for me it is to be at Zero Plants, but yet we're not here just to talk about plants. We're actually here to talk about this wonderful book that came out from Timber Press. It has two authors, Paul and Amy Campion. So, Amy, let, let me talk to you a little bit about this and what, what inspired you in it and what motivated you to, to be a part of it. Well, Timber asked me to do the editing on the book and the photos. And it was really an honor for me to do that because to work with Paul was was just amazing. Paul yeah. is he's amazing. He's an amazing plantsman. He's isn't he? an incredible yeah. plantsman. One of the most knowledgeable plantsmen I have ever met, and certainly one of the most knowledgeable in our area. Right, right. Now you actually moved here from where about five years ago, right? Where'd you come from? Well, I grew up in Minnesota, and I spent most of my adult gardening life in the Cincinnati area. Wow. So that, that's literally different a lot than in, the, in this area, isn't it? It is. And what is it that, what is it that you saw when you came here that, that you realize now, especially after reading this book, because you've told me you wish you had had this when you moved here because of all the information. So what, did, what does that mean to you? I do wish I'd had that book. I, I actually killed a lot of plants. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're not. A, we we often do that here <laughs> when too. When <laughs> I first started, I'm sure I'll kill a lot more. But I I didn't realize how dry our summers were. Right. I didn't realize uh, the the east winds that come through the gorge, and a lot of a lot of things, a lot of subtle things about our climate and our conditions. I didn't really understand. And right. had I known those things, I would have had a lot more success. And this book, it addresses all of those issues, doesn't it? Yes. And then it gives you a great selection, you know, and the pictures are stunning, but it's also a great layout of so many different varieties of plants from A to Z and what it takes to really grow them well here. Yeah, the, the plant profiles, uh, the plant selection is, is really cutting edge. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's pretty sophisticated, so even gardeners who are experienced, who have been in this area for a while, I think will really enjoy it. And that's one of the things I've liked about it is that there's stuff that I'm going, oh, I know that plant, but then you read about it and I'm going, oh, I didn't know that about it. So, uh, you know, we, we, we really do love this book, and now I'm going to throw it over to Judy, who's going to talk to Paul a little bit about things here at the store. Well, thanks, William. So now I'm with Paul, who's the co-author of that wonderful book. And so, Paul, we've heard all about what Amy said about the book, but now, we, of course, we have to talk about plants. So you've chose a couple that do really well here. So tell us about them. So I've chosen four plants that uh, we talk about in the book, and they're plants that we consider climate adapted. And that means that they like uh, winter, wet, summer, dry. We have dry summers and wet winters. And these plants can take those situations without any supplemental water in the summertime and uh, still thrive and look good. Uh, Manzanita is very popular. It's, uh, they're native to the west coast. This is Sunset, Arctostaphylos Sunset. Four feet tall and six feet wide, dense shrub, nice bark. Um, evergreen? It's evergreen, it has white full flowers, sun. full mm -hmm. sun, Lovely. and very easy to grow. It's a good landscape plant for uh, low maintenance. Nice, that's and really great. Long lived. Another, uh, another long lived uh, low water plant is the west coast native Matilaha poppy or Romnia culturae which gets about six to eight inch wide white flowers all Beautiful. summer long with a yellow center. It's also called fried egg flower. <laughs> it likes a, a no summer water and dry conditions and a wet in the winter. And that is really a cool one. This texture of the foliage is really pretty too. It's blue and it looks really good with the big white flowers. Nice, what's this one down here? It's down here, this is, um, people are familiar with rock roses. There's, those are known as cystus mostly. This is another cystus, but it's a different genus called holimium or sun rose or golden rock rose. Ooh and it bears um, yellow flowers for about two months in May through July. It's about three feet tall and five feet wide, evergreen, full sun, uh, little summer water, and uh, it's a good landscape plant, it's excellently adapted to our climate, and uh, pollinators like it, it gets a lot of butterflies. It's a beautiful flower, very nice. Yeah. And what about this last one? And this last one is, um, people are, are 
familiar with our flowering current, Ribes sanguinium. This is a hybrid between Ribes odoratum and Ribes sanguinium. This is uh, Ribes gardonianum, which uh, one has yellow flowers and one has pink flowers, and you combine the two and you get these salmon bicolor flowers. It's a large shrub for part shade, uh, light summer water, about eight feet tall and eight feet wide with orange red fall color, and it's super hardy to cold. It works on either sides of the cascades. Now these are all just wonderful plants that will do great for you in your garden. So if you're interested at all, you have to come to Zero Plants and give us the address and where are you? We're at 1114 Southeast Clay, which is in inner southeast Portland, one block south of Hawthorne. And you know, you could pick up your copy of this wonderful book here, or you can go to your favorite bookstore. Thanks so much. Thank you. I'm at Garden Fever today to talk about succulents, which is the plant pick of the week from Little Prince of Oregon. But before we talk about the succulents, we're going to talk with Lori from Garden Fever. How are you doing? Good. How are you? You have this buffet for terrariums, for dish gardens, mm -hmm. and succulents can be a part of that. But talk a little bit about all the bling that you could make for terrariums and dish gardens. Well, uh, terrariums, uh, I think of them as this little uh, fantasy world. <laughs> and there's uh, lots of bling that you would put in a fantasy world, lots of different color, texture, Gnomes. little people. <laughs> <laughs> so terrariums and, and dish gardens also can be done by adults or kids. Um, so you can do a glass container uh, or you can do some fun ceramic ones. If you're doing a terrarium with a glass container, you create all these different levels and each level can be a different color and then you can put all kinds of texture in there with either the succulents and then adding maybe some uh, bling from your garden, uh, mossy twigs, all That's kinds fun. of stuff you could do. Um, we like to do all these different layers of, of uh, gravel to give your own color personality. Everybody loves different colors. You've got a great color on now. So your, yours might be a series of blues. Oh, and some nice. people, you know, if you've got a kid that's got his favorite colors green, <laughs> there's nine million different greens. Uh, yeah. And if we're just totally inept at that, we think we are, you have staff to help us. Yep, we've got people that can tell you how to put it together. We've got handouts to put it together. Uh, we can get you going or we can walk you right through it and create one with you. Or you can say, hey, I kind of like these colors and these plants and we'll just put that together for you. Ah, they have everything here, really. Yep. Well, now I have to talk about plants because, you know, we always have to talk about plants with Mark from Little Prince. Hi. How you doing? I'm great. How are you? Well, great. And so we have to add greenery to these right. terrariums or dish gardens. So you have a great selection of tropical succulents. Right. So we do a line of tender succulents at Little Prince along with all the hardy succulents that we do. And one thing people have to remember about succulent plants is that these plants have evolved over millions <laughs> of years. And... And they don't like to be they don't like to be wet, and so the key for handling them at home is just don't water them very much. Um, and I also want to point out a couple great books about succulents. This is that one is by nice Robin one. Stockwell. Mm -hmm. That's a great one. And a book about terrariums that I love is by a local uh, garden designer and author, Kate Bryant, along with Amy Bryant Ayello. And so these are both resources that they have here at Garden Fever. Um, and when you're choosing a pot, make sure that it's got great drainage. So um, they have some contemporary designs here also that you can hang. Notice this one does not have any drainage holes, but they will drill them for you here at Garden Fever. So, And Mark, with the, with the care of the succulents, so indoors we would keep it bright spot, don't water it too much. Right. Can we put them outside for the summer? Yeah, definitely. Put, uh, I think they'll thrive best outside for the summer. Again, don't water them very much outside either. They just don't want any frost. Uh, oh, of course. Yeah. Well, you know, you can go to GardenTime.tv. We'll click you over to the Little Prince of Oregon website. You can find out where you can find all these lovely poppers, their tropical succulents, and also how to get to Garden Fever because it's a great little garden center to come to for all of your spring and summer needs. Thanks so much, you guys. Thanks. Thank you. Over the 30 years that our family has been in the nursery industry, we've learned that anyone can supply a customer with plants and garden supplies. But it's supplying those plants and supplies backed by a knowledgeable staff that can transform a garden and take it from ordinary to extraordinary. That's what we do at Sagawa Nursery. Why be ordinary when you can be extraordinary? Sagawa Nursery, growing beyond the ordinary. 
since 1982, the wall has been making local gardens beautiful, naturally. Whether you need a new wall, concrete patio, fire pit, or driveway, the wall's expert craftsmen can build it. We back up our work with a five-year warranty so you'll know it'll last. We use the highest quality materials, including stamped colored concrete, natural stone, and we're the leader in using recycled concrete. Create an outdoor environment you'll enjoy for years with the help of your friends at The Wall. Little Baja is your source for a whole lot of terracotta and concrete too. From bird baths and benches to Buddhas, bears, and fountains, plus the exclusive Baja chimney, we have an amazing variety of the finest in terracotta and concrete containers. Come check out our selection of statuary for any garden theme or setting. So for something for the garden, deck, or patio, come see us at Little Baja on East Burnside in Portland. Find us on Facebook, too. Welcome to Blooming Junction, where it's easy to connect with nature. At Blooming Junction, you'll find beautiful, healthy plants, good, fresh food, and a place to regain peace and calm in your life. We have an unsurpassed collection of unique and distinctive plants and the expertise to help any gardener be successful. And we feature Blooming Advantage plants. Come check out Blooming Junction for an inspiring experience in the garden or in the kitchen. Blooming Junction, offering quality plants for beautiful gardens. Well, we are so blessed in Portland to have Hoyt Arboretum, and I am with Martin, who is a curator here, and really this is a wonderful year for you, isn't it? It is. This is our 90th anniversary. Um, uh, April 25th is our birthday, and um, we... Yeah, we've been growing these trees for a long time. It is a long time. And so g give us a little bit of a history. It's like, who thought of this wonderful idea to have this arboretum right here in the middle of a city? So some of the original ideas go back to like the original Olmsted plans for Portland Parks, which was sort of in the early 1900s. And um, Emmanuel Misch and a few other people said that we should have an arboretum in Portland. It's a great location. We have a good climate. We could grow a lot of trees from around the world. Um, but it wasn't until like quite a bit later that they got all the funding and and got a lot of the pieces lined up. And there was the Portland Park superintendent, um, Paul Kieser, and uh, Thornton Munger, who was a regional forest supervisor. And they actually took the, um, took the petition to make this an arboretum to council, and, and uh, that's why we celebrate that date as our birthday. Ah, really visionary people here in Portland. And so this map is really one of the first drawings, landscape plan of the Arboretum. Yeah, so the, the map came a little bit after we went to council. And so this is from 1930. Um, it was uh, Duncan was the architect and he created this great play layout. Um, and a lot of the trees from this layout are still here. Oh. And um, we're actually going to go out in the field and we're going to go look at one of the first of the collection trees that was planted. And it's Plant number um, 68 in here, and it's a grand right fir. There, yeah. yeah, we're going to go check that out here in a second. All right, so you'll see us next. We'll be right in the Arboretum. Let's go. Excellent. Now, we've taken just a short walk from the visitor center. So, Martin, where are we now? So, we're just off of the fir trail, and um, this is really what we consider the true fir collection, so the ABs collection. And then right behind us is number 68. Yeah, this is <laughs> that tree that we found on the map, and um, this was actually uh, so this was planted in November in 1930. So really it's the first of the collection trees that was planted in the Arboretum. There was a group of trees that, was, that were planted. It wasn't just this one. There was a, a grove of grand firs that were planted. And really there's more heritage trees right around here too that are just within stone's throw. Yeah, so this um, was the part of the Arboretum they started planting in. And initially the Arboretum was really focused on conifers. We have a, a big tree collection outside of that, but because um, of Thornton Munger's connection with the U.S. Forest Service. They were developing a, a research arboretum um, called the Wind River Arboretum near White Salmon. And so they were bringing seeds from conifers from all around the world and, and then they were sharing that plant material with Portland Parks and Recreation. Um, and then once the material was big enough, they started planting it out at the arboretum. Um, a lot of the trees didn't, aren't still there oh. in Wind River because it's a lot colder. But for us, uh, most, uh, you know, a lot of those original trees are still growing here at the Arboretum 90 years later. That is amazing. And really, it's grown from that original 80 acres. Yeah, now we're about 200 acres. And um, the original plan was for about 450 species. And now we have uh, over 2,000 species. So, wow, wow. Yeah. So where does the name Hoyt come from then? So um, the Arboretum is named after Ralph Hoyt, who was actually a Multnomah County Commissioner. 
And when the land was originally owned by Multnomah County, he helped to make sure that it got transferred to Portland Parks. And then it was called Hoyt Park for the years up until it was designated as the Arboretum. Well, you know, it's always a wonderful time to come and walk at the Hoyt Arboretum, but this month especially, there's so much going on. So I'm going to go talk to Anna and we'll learn more about the events that are going on this month. Well, now I'm with Anna, who is the executive director of the Friends of the Hoyt Arboretum. Well, what a wonderful position that is. It's a lot of fun to work up here. I bet, I yeah. bet. And what a fun month April is. So tell us about what's going on this month. Sure. Well, we always make a really big deal out of April because it's Arbor Month and it's the beginning of many of our public programs. So, for example, every Saturday and Sunday, we have free tours of the Arboretum that are led by volunteers, and they leave from our visitor center at noon each day, and so people can just drop in and take a tour and learn a little something about um, one of our collections. Very nice. Um, and then we also uh, are trying, because it's our 90th birthday year, oh. we're using this opportunity <laughs> to kick off some new programs. Um, for example, this morning we had our first preschool program that we're calling tree time Aww. so we had 16 two three four year olds up ones. here and they went out for a little walk and then did a craft activity um, we're having some history talks some classes yeah. and a uh, book group and some guided hikes so a little bit of everything we want to bring all kinds of people up here sure. to Hoyt Arboretum to learn a little something about trees to introduce some new people to the Arboretum well, definitely and I heard something about birthday party there's a birthday party because you only turn 90 once. Of course. Right, so we want to make a big deal out of it. So the last weekend in April on the 28th, we're having a big family-friendly party um, at 10 in the morning. And we'll have some music here, right here at the Stevens Pavilion. We're going to have a story time on the Redwood Deck. Timber Joey is going to be Ooh. reading the story. Um, and we'll have some crafts, and of course, we'll have a big birthday cake. Oh, well, so we've we got to come for cake. Everybody right. to come <laughs> join us on April 28th to help celebrate 90 years at Hoyt Arboretum. And Anna, I would think that organizations you always are looking for people to help support, and um, where do we get information about that? Sure. Well, I invite everyone to visit our website, which is hoytarboretum.org. And the Hoyt Arboretum is almost 200 acres, and it takes a lot mm -hmm. of um, time and energy and volunteers sure. to keep this place looking nice for visitors and then to engage people here. And so the Hoyt Arboretum Friends is a membership organization. There are people all across the city mm -hmm. who join together to provide some extra support for Hoyt Arboretum. That is wonderful. So really, you can come here, you can have a great time, but you can also support the Hoyt Arboretum in many other ways. So please go to gardentime.tv. We'll click you over their website and you can find out all the information about what's going on here. Thanks so much, Anna. Thanks. Thanks for all you do. Yeah. Thanks. Garden Time is brought to you by Portland Nursery, a passion for plants, a nursery for plant people. Hi, I'm Sarah from Portland Nursery, where spring is our favorite time of year. It's the time to prepare your garden for planting. We invite you to get a jump on spring with our huge selection. Let Portland Nursery's staff of professionals help with groceries you can grow. We've got the seeds, veggie starts, and expertise to ensure your success. Visit PortlandNursery.com for a list of classes and special events. Portland Nursery, helping make your backyard your favorite destination at 50th and Stark and 90th and Division. Your garden is only as good as the ingredients you use. That's where Black Gold can help. Black Gold Seedling Mix is formulated for successful seed germination and strong seedling growth. Black Gold Seedling Mix is organic and OMRI listed, so you can start this year's organic garden outright. Look for Black Gold at your local garden center or go online to blackgold.bz. Black Gold, all the riches of the earth. Join the Oregon Garden for Digging in the Dirt, presented by Columbia Bank. Beginning at 10 a.m., you'll enjoy a day outdoors planting our spring annual flowers. After you're done, sit back and relax in the beautiful garden with a brunch buffet, live music, and bottomless mimosas. You'll also receive a piece of the garden to take home with you. Enjoy the day digging in the dirt. Check out the Oregon Garden website for more information. Color, color, color. When you think of your garden, think of color. Then think of Margie's Farm and Garden. High quality plants and great customer service are our trademark. 
We're open for the season and stocked full of plants. If your garden is ready for spring, so are we. We're chock full of annuals, perennials, and veggies. And remember, we're open seven days a week. Vegetables or herbs, hanging baskets or perennials, trust Margie's Farm and Garden. Just off I-5 near Aurora. So I'm here with Jack Biggie, and if you know, if you have the pleasure of knowing Jack Biggie, there's a lot of things you think about him, but one of the first things I think about Jack is asparagus, because <laughs> we are in your asparagus house, and you're gonna, you're gonna go over, you know, why you, how you plant it well, and then how you get this great crop and how you take care of it. So jump right in when you're ready. Well, uh, this, this patch here, in here, has been in, uh, seven or eight years wow. now and it's uh, starting to reach prime. Uh, I picked uh, seven pounds of snapped asparagus, so about 15 pounds of with stump and all on it. Uh, yeah, uh, Saturday, this is Monday. Yeah, I did it Saturday. So this is two days and they were cold days. Normally, if we have one this big in the morning, by evening it'll be this big. Wow on a 60 degree day outside, which will be 90 degrees in here, or 85 So degrees. you really did this tunnel specifically because you love asparagus, you love growing right. it, eating it, right. and this really is a prime way to get large crops. Well, not only that, but it brings, I cheat. <laughs> it brings me in about six weeks earlier okay. than they normally would. Right outside that door, I have another bed, the mirror image of this, which will start in about 30 days. So you do both, you do it in the thing. I do this out. and then that, and I will be picking both of them for quite a while. But this one, the asparagus is actually better because it grows much faster, and the faster it grows, the more tender it is and the sweeter it is. So would that be true even outside, and if you don't have a, a really cool tunnel like this to grow in, even outside if you have great soil, if you make sure the water's right, all of that, that would help that too? And the warmer weather, warmer weather. you'll find your asparagus is better eating because it simply grows fast. I, it will grow six inches in a day. Yeah, yeah. You can almost stand there and watch it if you have the time. So now at Al's, um, you, you have you grow some for sale as well as right. the, the, the ones that yeah, are just Yeah, we, we do it two ways. Uh, and and this, do you plant them the same then? Almost. Uh, this is what we call bare root, and it's a one-year plant. And to put this, you just take and spread it out, this being the sure. crown and the top, spread it out in the bottom of the hole, fill and plant. Okay? The advantage of the gallon is it's a year older. Okay. This, you're gonna to have to wait two years to harvest. Grow it up, let it go down, grow it up, let it go down, and then harvest, and start harvesting next the next year to build up rootstock. Right. But once you get asparagus patch uh, developed, I had one up here that I took out before this. It was 20 years old. It was still producing wow. perfectly. Wow. So then that would be the way you would plant those. But now right these now. ones that are already growing, right. is these there any just difference One those? year older, one year older, and we just plant it just like it is here. And both of them, you'll notice this hole is about six inches deep. It is, deep. yeah, it's a big hole. Uh, the reason for that is we want it down three or four inches deep at least because if you cut asparagus, you always want to cut it under the ground. Oh, okay. Okay? My ground's so soft that I don't cut it. You I just break it. it. Off. Okay. But notice I got four inches right. of under the ground. If you cut it off at the ground or leave a stump, it will dry up and quit producing on that eye. If you take this off, it'll keep producing and keep producing all summer. Okay, all right, that makes okay. a lot more sense then. So, and that's why a lot of people will cut it under the ground, but cut it two or three inches under the ground. Okay. So that it comes back again. So that's why you're digging a deeper hole deeper and hole planting it deeper So that well. when you cut it, you miss the crown right, with right. a knife. Nice, okay. Okay, I didn't put enough fur, I didn't put any fertilizer in that hole, so I just take a good handful of fertilizer and you use just a general purpose fertilizer? No, a no, a, kind? a transplant. This is all organic transplant. Okay. And uh, it's a very slow release. And you want this slow releasing all summer, a little bit at a time to build root. Okay. You want to build root the first year or two. 
put it down now, in the bottom? I can tell you right now, Jack, I know people that will say, well, can I cut and eat these once I plant it? <laughs> no, no, <Okay>. no. <laughs> well, first off, you'd starve to death doing <laughs> Wait it. For that. But, but other than that, no, you've got to build root stock, and by letting these go to feather, they'll come up and go to feather, what we call it feather, uh -huh. fern. And, uh, and that builds energy to the that roots. That puts energy okay. into the root. Okay, sounds good. And then you'll leave that fern there until it turns totally brown. And don't get in a hurry in the fall to get your garden in shape and take it down. Usually about Christmas, I take mine wow, down. Wow, okay. You'll let all of that carbohydrates that's stored in the leaves drain into the roots. Perfect. And that builds your root stock. Remember, asparagus is a grass. It is nothing more than grass. So a very heavy feeder, very heavy nitrogen and water. Okay. And uh, you can't believe how fast it grows. Yeah, yeah. And so then when you're, when you're putting the, the, the fertilizer in, you've got this right. in, got you this just in. fill that back the, in? Not there. exactly. No. <laughs> not exactly. Fill it about three inches from the top and leave it. Wow. Now, as more comes up and it grows, you will continue to fill okay. until you get to the top, especially if you're doing it bare root because these roots don't have enough strength to push through six inches of dirt. All right. Okay. So you cover them with two inches of dirt, let them grow up, and when they get above ground level, go ahead and cover them then. But at first, you have to leave them countersunk. Okay, that makes sense. So then that's it for a while. That's it. You let it go this year to feather. Do not cut any. Next year you can cut a little bit, but let most of it go to feather. The following year you're in for the next 20 years or more. Well, there you go. Now, asparagus is delicious. It's a wonderful thing to grow in your garden and eat. So for more information, you can go to any of the Al's uh, garden centers and talk to them about it. Buy up some asparagus for your own and just Put yourself into the gap, that commitment because you're going to have some delicious asparagus pretty soon. Thank you so much, my friend. You Always betcha. appreciate it. You betcha. Glad to have you. No matter what shade your green thumb is, you can find the plants and the help you need at Wavra Farms. We're filled with an astounding array of colorful plants to fill your garden. In addition to wonderful annuals and perennials, we are known for our hanging baskets. We also have all your garden essentials and we have great garden gifts too. From beginner to expert, you'll find something new and different with every visit. Wavra Farms, located off Highway 22, exit 5, east of Salem. Millions of tulip bulbs transform the Iverson Farm into one of Oregon's most beautiful events. The family invites you to the Wooden Shoe Tulip Festival. Explore our tulip fields and market, kids' activities, and great food and wine. The Wooden Shoe Tulip Festival, open daily 9 to 6, now through April 30th. DRAM is celebrating 75 years of design and manufacturing of quality watering tools. DRAM products feature nine water patterns and are designed to nurture your plants with a shower of rain. Dram for Lawn and Garden, available at garden centers near you. The health and beauty of your garden starts from the ground up, and healthy soils begin at Grimm's Fuel. For the best in garden mulch, blended soils, and bark dust, choose Grimm's. You haul delivered or installed, Grimm's can do it. And if you're looking for a new lawn, Grimm's can do that too with our special lawn installation service. Grimm's is also the area's largest recycler of yard debris. The foundation for a healthy garden begins at Grimm's Fuel. Your center for home and garden decor, Garden Gallery Ironworks has everything you need to make your home a showcase. For the inside, we have a great selection of Kelly Ray Roberts items, and our farmhouse style department is full of one-of-a-kind gifts. For the outside, we have arbors, trellises, planting beds, and garden decor. Everything to make your neighbors jealous. Check out our new website and then come visit us in Hubbard, Garden Gallery Ironworks.
Well, it is tulip time at the Wooden Shoe Tulip Festival, and I'm with Barb. And Barb, you know, some people are a little concerned because we've had some wacky weather, but I see lots of color here. Well, it, it really blew over the weekend, and, and the rain came down, and it was muddy out here. But as you can see, when the sun comes out, it's absolutely gorgeous. It is. The, the blossoms, it was early enough in the season, so fortunately, we didn't lose too many petals. Ah, excellent. And you know, for homeowners, it's like sometimes we get nervous about it, but man, these are tough little plants. They're really sturdy. <laughs> they really are. And so what can we expect when we come? Because there's still oh, color till we, the end of the month. Yeah, till the end of the month. We're open through April 30th, but you never know if the weather stays cool. We may go longer. Okay. You never know. It's a little early to call that. Right. But, uh, you know, you can wander through the field. That's the big thing. That is. You know, we have a lot of activities for the kids. We have wine tasting. We have our own vineyard here, so there's wine ah, tasting. Big kids. Uh, big kids. <laughs> and then um, we've got the display beds, you know, where we have all the different varieties in our catalog. And you can order those bulbs, and we'll ship them to you in the fall when it's time to plant. And really, it's not too late to enjoy them in our own garden. Garden, isn't it? Well, that's right. We've got <laughs> potted tulips up there for sale. And they're absolutely beautiful. But if you don't want to do that, we have cut flowers as well. If I don't know if the cut flower, I mean, the cut flower is one of the only flowers that continues to grow ah. once you cut it. So the stem actually gets longer. So cool. you're, when you have it in your vase at home, it kind of looks different from day to day. That's because it's the, the stem's growing. Well, if you haven't made it out to the Tulip Festival, you have to come. Go to gardentime.tv. We'll click over their website. There's all kinds of information on their website. And you have to come out with your camera and all your friends and family. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks for coming out. I just love being somewhere that I'm surrounded by plants and friends. And I'm with Ken from Van Essen. And Ken, we're usually out at your nursery. So here we are at a coastal farm and ranch. So yeah. what gives? So yeah, we usually are at the nursery. Uh, but I wanted to do a spot about our plants uh, in, in the setting of one of our independent partners. And Coastal is one of our very good partners that we have. And so I thought it'd be nice to do this here today. And it's fun that we can go there and we can buy plants. Yeah, so yeah, that's right. even more fun. Yeah. So what are you going to talk to us about? So let's talk about a couple new things that we sure. have. So Coastal is going to be doing uh, a nice offering of our patio trees. Nice. Which we have sitting around us, mm -hmm. like here and here. And every two weeks, we're going to be bringing in fresh sets of nice. new varieties. Um, this one here is cherry vodka dogwood. Uh, it gets about four to five feet in, in size and gets a, has a really good thick leaf. So it's very durable and it's got this great red color that starts in the summer. You see there's Pretty. three colors mm -hmm. and then goes all the way through the fall. And what about the tree to your left? Yeah, this is another uh, cornice. It is a yellow twig cornice. This is called cream de mint. Mm -hmm. And it is very striking when it has its foliage Pretty. and its variegation. It's not, it's got a creamy, creamy variegation and when it's when you look at the block across the can yard and there's you know 500 a thousand of them out there versus yeah. another they just really pop from a long distance oh, and definitely. they do great same thing containers in the landscape same sort of dimensions on the head size so you have these beautiful trees what else do you want to show us well i wanted to talk to you about the clematis these are uh, clematis that are part of our vibrant selection line and there's a great great assortment of colors cool. uh, that they have but really what i wanted to talk about on the clematis is is that it's, it's got a great root system. It's in a true eight inch, not just a real small one gallon. Mm -hmm. And we've held this plant a lot longer than typical growers might do. And so we put a lot of prunes in it. So you can see here at the base, heavy branching, which gives you lots of vines and really a lot more flowers at retail. And so these are just coming into the stores now and they'll filter in over the next three or four weeks. Um, but this is a very good quality product that, that Coastal carries. And I love it in that pot, so really it's ready to go. Yeah, it is ready to go. Uh -huh. And then what else you have? Well, we have our whole perennial line, and it's a premium perennial line. And here's another example of one of the items. Um, this is a uh, flaming carpet, and it's three colors in one. It's a great and idea. And it's, it's a big hit. We ship it all over the country, um, you know, into Denver, even into Chicago. Uh, but it works well in a container, as you can see, or in the landscape. Uh, and it's just one of the unique things that Coastal has in their perennial line. And again, every two weeks we're dropping in fresh perennials. They've got a nice assortment already. And so that's an exciting part of their, their group. It is great. What a great collection right here. It is. And then one more thing you have, a reblooming azalea. What a great idea. Yes, this is uh, a reblooming azalea. It's a proven winner. This is one of their bloomathons. And Reblooming azaleas now have been really the most important thing that's happened in the azalea uh, breeding line in the last 10, 15 years. And so this will bloom now really well, and then you can prune it and it will rebloom again summertime ish, 
uh, and it's great for the garden. It's not just a one and done. So as you heard it from Ken, that they're going to have a great selection of plants at your coastal farm and ranch. So go to gardentime.tv, we'll click over their website, and you can find out the coastal near you, and you can get plants for your garden and your patio. Thanks so much, Ken. Thank you. This week's plant pick is brought to you by Little Prince. Our plants won't croak. Your garden begins here with the people in purple, the ones you meet inside each Owl's Garden and Home store. Come celebrate our 70th year with us. More than ever, we're working to bring you a truly exceptional gardening experience. Juicy summer tomatoes begin now. Our one-gallon tomato starts are on sale for just $2.49 each. The sale ends soon, so hurry in. The best gardens begin and continue to grow at Al's Garden and Home in Woodburn, Sherwood, Gresham, and Wilsonville. Millions of tulip bulbs transform the Iverson Farm into one of Oregon's most beautiful events. The family invites you to the Wooden Shoe Tulip Festival. Explore a tulip fields and market, kids activities, and great food and wine. The Wooden Shoe Tulip Festival, open daily 9 to 6, now through April 30th. Create a beautiful living space both inside and out with the help of Terra Casa. Outside, you'll find pottery, fountains, and decor to make your garden unforgettable. And inside, there are home furnishings and just the right accents to make your home warm, inviting, and most importantly, comfortable. Terracasa has a huge selection of merchandise to fit any home or budget. Plus, we still have all the unique and distinctive gifts that you have come to expect from Terracasa. Terracasa in downtown Damascus. DRAM is celebrating 75 years of design and manufacturing of quality watering tools. DRAM products feature nine water patterns and are designed to nurture your plants with a shower of rain. DRAM for lawn and garden, available at garden centers near you. Come to where the color is. Come to Egan Gardens. We've worked hard growing healthy plants for you so that your gardening is easy. Add sparkle to your garden with our perennials, container plants, and skillfully designed baskets and planters. Container gardening is the easiest way to plant a lot of beauty in a small space. Find great containers at our shop or join us on the 21st to build your own. Egan Gardens, where it's all about the plants. We're located west of I-5 at exit 263 on River Road. So you might not know this, but April is the National Safe Digging Month, and I'm here with Scott from Northwest Natural because you guys already are part of a program that really helps gardeners dig safely in their yard. What, what is that about? Absolutely. Uh, there's a national program, and it's you can use it in Oregon or Washington, anywhere around. You just call 811 before you dig, and uh, all the utilities that are in the area that you're going to be working will come out and put paint on the ground or mark the area so that you know where they're at. So utilities, that's, that's a, a word that involves a lot of different things, I would think. What, what are utilities? So obviously we're a natural gas company. Uh, you'll find the power companies come out or cable or communication companies come out, water, sewer. So really everything that we get that comes into our home pretty much comes through the ground a lot of times. Correct, and they're obviously in your front yard or your backyard, you never know where they're at. Well now, as a gardener, I look at you know the shovels that I use, and you know, I, I'm never really gonna dig that deep except if I'm putting a tree in or something, but you really suggest that even if you're just gonna use a, a regular spade, maybe 12 inches, you should call. Correct, yeah. The law says that anything you dig over, anytime you dig over 12 inches, you're supposed to call 811. Um, but we recommend that you do it anytime you're gonna do any type of digging in your yard. If you're planting a tree right. or fence posts, obviously those times you'd be digging more than 12 inches, so you'd be required to call by law. Um, but even if you're just planting flowers or moving some shrubs around, it's just a good idea. It's a free service. They'll come out and mark it. Well, a couple of things here. First of all, I think that a lot of times people forget that, um, you know, there, there are things that, that change in the ground. So even if you think, oh, I'm not going that deep, there can be some, some increase in movement. So you might be hitting something that you think is deeper anyway. Absolutely. We, we won't. We'll come out and put marks on the ground for you so you know where we're at, but we won't tell you how deep they are because as, as any time you install something, as time goes on, the depth might change right. due to whatever you might be doing in your yard. And so it's just important once you see those marks, just to dig really carefully over the top of them, regardless of how deep you're going. Because if you don't do this, if you don't do this, anything that I damage while I'm digging, if I haven't you know, covered myself with this, that, that's on me, the homeowner. Absolutely, so not only do you run the risk of uh, potentially causing an emergency, yeah. 
it, there's, there can be some pretty heavy, uh, not only fines, but a bill as well that could come your way. And so if you don't want to do that, this is really simple. All you do is dial 811, right? Correct. And then how long? Am I waiting a week, a couple weeks? So you need to call between two and 10 business days before you are planning to excavate. So if you want to dig this weekend on Friday, just make sure you make your call before Tuesday or Wednesday. Yeah. And then all the marks will be down on Friday and you'll be able to do any type of digging you do all weekend. And this, this whole program, this is free. I don't have to pay you to come do this. No, it's absolutely free. And they say that if you call for a locate, uh, it decreases your potential to have a damage by 99%. So Scott, even with this, this great free program you guys are working with, um, you still have incidents occur. Yeah, we do. <laughs> Every day we have damages. In fact, damages have been on the rise for the last couple of years, as has uh, construction in the right. area. So it's not a big surprise that they would go up as well. And what are you holding here? What are these pipes? So I'm just holding, I just brought a couple of examples of what pipes you might uh, find in the ground. This would be the uh, size of just an average household service line um, and it would run up to your house. So if you're digging from the street up to your property, you might find a pipe like this. Out in front of your house, you might find this w uh, as a gas main that might be serving a whole neighborhood. So somehow they'd come off. So these are things you might see. They're, th these are plastic. We do have steel lines in the ground as well. Um, but if, you know, you, you can tell they're fairly malleable, right. you can nick them with a shovel. So. Well, that's what I was going to say. What if I called, I started digging, thought I was being careful, and I realized I've ticked that. Even if I don't smell gas, I should still call you guys, right? Absolutely. Anytime you think you hit any utility, whether it's gas or power or cable, and you scratch the coating on something, you want to call right away. We, we want to respond. We want to make the call whether or not it's safe to leave in the ground. Well, there you have it. And this is a great month if you've never done this before, because we're all going to be planting soon and digging in our gardens. It's a free thing, free 811. Call them, set up the time, and then do your digging with some confidence. And we really appreciate Northwest Natural for, for stepping up and coming out here and telling us how we can make our gardens and our whole neighborhoods more safe. Thank you so much, Scott. You're welcome. Since 1987, French Prairie Gardens has brought you the best in farm fresh produce, beautiful plants, and memorable family events. Spring is here, and now is the time to get your garden ready with our wide selection of bedding plants and hanging baskets. Experience the best the country has to offer at French Prairie Gardens. Want to create something extraordinary? Create perfection. Thermidor's lifestyle appliances make it easy. Right now, save up to $85.46 with our exclusive one, two, free event. Try before you buy in our live Thermidor kitchens. Oregon-based and family-owned, setting the standard since 1947. Standard TV and appliance. Extend your growing season and escape to your own garden retreat in a Solex greenhouse from the Greenhouse Catalog. There is nothing like the taste of a bright, red, juicy, homegrown tomato. The bright, warm, durable design of a Solex greenhouse provides plenty of room to nurture your plants and enjoy your passion for years. Choose from five Solex greenhouse models or build your own with Solex panels. For all your gardening, greenhouse, and specialty growing needs, visit GreenhouseCatalog.com or give us a call. At Garland Nursery, you'll find top quality plants, four generations of garden know-how, fun and fantastic garden decor, and the best in garden supplies. Come visit us at Garland Nursery. Since 1937, inspiring beautiful and bountiful gardens. Well, spring pond care is about keeping that clear water. And I'm with Brian at Sugawa Nursery in Woodland. And so, Brian, you really have some tips on how to keep that water nice and clear all year long. Yeah, well, that's right. Right now, if you look out in the ponds, it's, you know, the water's always so nice and clear. And it's a good goal to try to keep, you know, everybody sure. likes to <laughs> be able to see their fish. But I think some of the things to consider, you know, we usually we liked water temperatures right around 45, 50 degrees, probably preferably 50. You know, that's when they're acting a lot more. They're coming out of their dormancies, but we have a lot of fish waste, plant waste, things that have died in the winter, and that's that usually that mm. sludge is looking. So 
there's a, a good uh, uh, natural way of trying to do this, and this would be all beneficial bacteria. So it's all there's no chemicals. You know, fish okay. are pretty. You know, they don't like to to be you know altered with. We, you know, even like pesticides and different course, things like sure. that. They're very sensitive, especially mm -hmm. if you're raising koi. But uh, the microlith PL would just be basically adding beneficial bacteria into the water that would help decompose or just speed up the process of getting that all down to the bottom of the of your ponds. Okay. And at that point you can either consider, you know, the sludge away or there's vax, but basically we just gotta get it out. You know, mm -hmm. it's floating around or what wherever it's at. It's accumulating, it goes down to the bottom. And that's where the sludge away uh, would actually speed up the process of getting rid of that just naturally. It just would be beneficial bacteria that actually kind of eats it up ah. and uh, you won't see it. So, or you can use a vac by physically removing it with a vac or whatever you want to do. All right. And then what about this group over here? This one here would be, well, it'd be probably the faster way. We have two products, Algae Fix and then AccuClear. These obviously are going to be chemicals, safe for fish, plants, and everything else. But it does the same thing, but in a probably more... Uh, it would be a lot more, you know, obviously uh, the, the oh, okay. earth-friendly way, mm -hmm. organic, or just uh, a little slower process. A little slower like process, natural. just like mm -hmm. anything. The, the natural, you'd want to use this more regular. This would be more quicker results okay. for the people that are probably less patient, but it works <laughs> fast. And we also, so it's the same thing. We're going to use Algae Fix. It's going to get everything down to the bottom. And then we want to go ahead and after you get it down, it's accumulated at the bottom, then we're going to want to get rid of it and then put back are with uh, the liquid bacteria, oh, okay. the beneficial bacteria to help balance or put back what we kind of depleted out of there. Aha. Uh -huh. And then what about this one in the center? What's yeah. this one for? Well, this one, there's all sorts of different, there's like three kinds of major algae. So there's one, uh, this, but basically algae is algae. This one here is going to be green clean. Usually when you see that string like ah, algae okay. that's always on the rocks of your stream beds, you, for sure. some reason it's always on the stream beds or the right. waterfalls hanging off the rocks or whatever. Uh, Green Clean is excellent product. Shut down the, the, the actually the flow of the water. So whether it means turn your pumps off or whatever, you want to have, it has to have contact to the algae, the string algae. Mm -hmm. And then you just put it on, it turns brown or black and it's gone within probably one day. Oh, wow. Start your, your uh, filter back up, get the waterfall going back. And the, this would actually be down in the bottom if it's a, uh, Eventually, it's going to find its way down the bottom, and then sure. we're again going to want to get remove right. that too with the you know it's a sludge, so it's sure. actually going to find its way. You can either net it out, vac it out, or use the beneficial bacteria to get it ate up. Okay, and then one thing more about uh, fish. So, is it mm -hmm. the time to start feeding fish? We always yeah. are like, when do we start feeding? Oh, and them? they are too. They're always acting <laughs> and hungry, and whenever you come around, but we you know it's probably going to be. The, the temperature we usually shoot for is right around 50 degrees. Okay. They, and that's when, because they'll come up, you go out there right now, the water temperature is probably 40, 35 degrees. And they're acting, you know, they're just coming out of dormancy. So, you know, everybody <laughs> me, wants, yeah. Me. But no, it's best to probably wait at 50 degrees. That, right. That's the time that uh, everything balances out probably. Ah. Well, you know, really, this is the time to come out to Sagawa Nursery and talk with them about getting your pond just ready for the whole season of entertaining and enjoying your garden. Thanks so much, Brian. Yeah, thanks, Judy. We want to thank you for watching today, and we want to thank Garden Fever for letting us hang out. We also wanted to thank all of you again that came out to Garden Palooza, and we look forward to seeing you at our next event. If you have any questions about today's show or any other show, please go to GardenTime.tv. We're delighted you spent time with us today, and we'll do it all again next week, right here on Garden Time. The proceeding was a paid program of the Gustin Creative Group and its sponsors.